Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm really glad many people are excited about colors, so it's not only me. Um, so just like to give you a short introduction of the idea of the talk, um, like this year in spring, I went to the Hannover Fair, like the former CeBIT, and like all the companies are there having their cool dashboards, and they all looked horrible. And I was like, yeah, maybe somebody should tell them what they're doing wrong. Um, so I came up with that idea um, for a talk. So um, I'm Daniel. Um, I work in a small um, consultant company called Uncoot IT. Um, and I'm also, like as you see with the color of my t-shirt, one of the organizers of uh, PyData Berlin. So I'm really happy to have that many people here. And I hope we have some really cool um, days here. So um, like I don't have that much time. So just to give like a short introduction, like I want to talk a little bit about um, color theory, like the history, some important people. Uh, where you probably know most of them. Um, I will talk a little bit about like color wheels. So like it will be pretty, hopefully, a lot of the slides. So it will be something pleasing to watch. Um, I walk, will talk a little bit about color models and um, then give you some like psychology background um, and give you some like ideas on the road. So like it's not that easy to choose good colors in general. So I just want to like give you some ideas where to get started and like what really to avoid. And um, I will end with some do's and don'ts to give get you like some ideas um, what to do. Um, so like, first of all, like to get started, like I want all of you to think about like, what is a color and to like try to describe the c uh, color, for example, green without examples of objects that are green. And then you will maybe realize it's quite difficult to describe what green is if you don't can come up with examples. Um, and that's because like color is a really abstract concept in general. So, um, yeah, like if you think about back in school, you probably know those charts about like human cone cells um, and how we as a human see colors. Um, and that were like with this like wavelength. Um, and we have those three different um, cone cells for colors for like short, medium and long um, wavelengths. And this is kind of how we as a human um, see colors. And um, this is just like a short recap to get you an idea. Um, this dashed line R is like a different cone cell, which is only there for like darkness, but not for color. Um, but yeah, like this is kind of like how it works in the human brain. And like, we'll see some of those references later. Um, and just now to be aware of like the connection of red and, um, and green is quite important later on. So um, to get started, like what, what is color theory? Like why is it quite a cool topic in my opinion? It's like, first of all, it's a science and it's an art. So it's kind of something like changing, like it's something with like a personal preference and taste. So it makes it quite exciting. There's not always like a right or wrong. It's always something to, to negotiate. Um, it's a lot about like human perception, like not everybody sees the same. Like this is also quite interesting in that field. And um, we'll talk about it later a little bit about um, psychology. Um, and the field is also about like color mixing, where you see the connection to art, like to mix colors together for painting, for example. Um, it's about communication and um, also like color theory also describes method to um, re replicate colors, for example, in different settings. Um, if you think about like printing a page, it should look like the way it looks on your computer. So like you use color theory and all that um, all the time. So like to start really back in the days, like to just give you like some short introduction of like really important people in that field. Um, the first one being uh, Aristoteles, who was a like, Greek philosopher. And he wrote a book, like basically the first known book about color called uh, the Coloribus, which is which just means like on colors. And um, his concept of colors were that like all colors come from like white lightness um, and dark, um, something like, like black color. Um, which is quite good in a way of like we understand light now to the, like light, like white light is basically the full spectrum. Um, and like you see a lot of people connect colors to something like, um, like they, they can like see and, um, he used uh, the four elements, water, air, earth, and fire to connect that to the colors. So like he created this like first, um, basic color palette with like some different colors. And yeah, like if we go way later, um, probably nobody heard of like Leon Alberti, who was like a quite famous Italian architect. Um, and now you think like, yeah, like an architect, what does he have to do with colors? Um, and he was doing a lot of like theoretical work in general. And he wrote a book called Die Pictura, which means on painting. So he wrote like a guideline book for painting. And it was a lot about perspective, composition and colors. Um, 
So he did not really, like, he was also a painter a little bit, but didn't really get that successful. So like, I guess he was not that good. Um, but he defined that, like, black and white are not colors, which is also quite interesting in a way that we see it now. Um, and who made, like, big use of all the stuff he was writing in that book, but, like, not really able to, to like, practice was, oh, first of all, yeah, he came up in that book with color mixing. Um, so it was also like the first guy ever to like mix colors together in a book to like show how you can like create new colors with mixing colors together. And um, yeah, like what I said before, like you probably all know like Da Vinci and he really used all the theory in that book from Alberti uh, and used that for like creating his paintings for like many beliefs like are like the best paintings ever created by by uh, humankind. And um yeah, like he used all that concept of colors and perspective and composition in his book. So like he really like made practice out of the, the concepts that um, Alberti was doing. And then, um, yeah, I guess Isaac Newton is like another guy who was really influential and like maybe the most influential scientist ever. Um, and yeah, you probably all know like his prism experiment, um, like like worst of all from the Pink, Pink Floyd cover on the left. So uh, I don't know how many of you remember that the original experiment had two prisms. Um, so the left one where like white light passes through the prism and um, it breaks into the whole spectrum of colors. So like, which is basically the Pink Floyd cover. Um, but then in his experiment, he also had a second prism where um, only one of those colors was going through and he needed that to conclude that the prism does not alter or like change the color that goes through it. It will just, um, um, yeah, like spread the white light into all the all the possible colors. So like he needed that second second prism um, as well. And what he did then, like with this like you know middle line with all those colors, was he was the first guy to like come up with a color wheel. Um, and like we'll see a couple of those now. Like I created the right one just for you to show because it's only in black and white. And what is quite interesting here is like the number of colors that you choose on your color wheel is quite arbitrary. Like it just depends on like your personal preference or like what do you see. Um, and what's quite interesting here is like before we are seeing like colors that were mapped to the four elements of the earth, he mapped colors to musical intervals. So like to C, D and like all of those, uh, which you can uh, kind of see on the, on the, on the left here. So that's also like a quite interesting connection, uh, in my opinion, to like, again, combine kind of science and art into one field. Um, then like we have uh, Johann uh, Schiffermüller, who was an Australian naturalist, and he was the first guy to come up with this continuous color wheel. So he combined all those colors into something like more continuous, like the way we use it now. Um, he came up with those like 12 colors. Like if you can read German, you can maybe um, see that. Um, and also what he was working on was like, in addition to that picture that you see here, he described a table with 81 shades of the color. Um, we'll get soon to like what a shade is like by definition. Um, but it gets quite interesting. And here you see a real big connection to, um, to art and painting. And uh, Moses Harris um, was like another guy, like an English guy who wrote a book that took him like quite a while, like seven years. And in that book, he um, he talked a lot about like color mixing, also like quite the like artistic mindset. Um, and like what I want to point out, like I don't know how many of you have seen that picture, which is quite famous. Um, if you see, if you look in the middle, you have just like three um, triangles of blue, yellow, and just like reddish color. Um, which were like his main colors that he used. And if you check in the middle where all those colors overlap, it creates some kind of shade of black. So like we'll see that later in some different color models. So like he was like the first guy to come up with like that idea. Um, and like his idea is just to help artists to create colors for their painting. But like we still use some of that stuff now. Then some guy you probably did not expect here. So like I don't know how many of you are German, but like you probably all know Goethe from like being a writer, like really successful. Um, in addition to that, he was also like a statesman. Like he worked in politics. Uh, he was a scientist as well and an artist. And um, he wrote a really important book called The Theory of Colors, uh, which was a lot about the human um, color perception. Um, and he was also like a big painter. Like he was painting a lot of pictures that are quite good, um, which I guess many people really don't know. So he created this like six color color wheel that you see here um, in that book. Um, and there's like a few things that are quite special here. So first of all, he was the first guy who recognized how important the magenta is. And if you think about printing, you still have like magenta print. 
So he was the first guy who really understand the importance of that color. Um, and like, it's quite difficult to read, like even if you read German, but um, in that color wheel, he put in some attributes to colors. So like he gave them some kind of like feeling uh, what they what they say. So in that example, like he said, yellow is um, yellow is good, and the green is useful, and he says like violet is unnecessary. So it's quite like you know random, like his personal taste. But um, it's quite interesting if you think about like color biology and what colors do. Um, and he also came up with a concept of warm colors and cool colors. Um, we'll see that later again. Uh, but I th think that's quite cool. So maybe he combined his like poetic mindset with colors and co like created those those combinations. Um, in an earlier study, he also had a color wheel where he had some like occupation and character uh, traits that he mapped to colors. So like melancholic being like reddish colors, for example. Um, so I guess quite quite interesting in in that way. And um, yeah, like another um, German guy, like Philipp Runge, um, he was like a pen pal with uh, Goethe. So they both worked on colors in a way. And um, he was the first guy who um, put like a, a third dimension into um, into those color wheels. So like now we don't have a color wheel anymore. We have this color sphere. Um, and on the top two, you see the, the two poles of it. So like he had three three main colors, which were like yellow, red, and blue. And then on the top of the of the pole, um, you see like the white, the white pole, and on the on the right here you see uh, black. So um, the two bottom pictures here are just like if you cut that that like ball horizontally or vertically, uh, and this just creates like way more um, ideas what you can do with colors and like create like many new many new shades. So like who took that on the next level um, was Albert Mansell, um, who was an American painter and teacher of art. Um, and what he de developed was is basically still the like de facto standard in America. So like he took the ideas and like really made them into like scientific, um, and came up with like some some concept. And um, he defined um, three dimensions, um, which you can see here. Um, we'll see those like different like those terms later again, like in more detail, just to give you an idea of like the color system that he he created. Uh, quite important is like this ring of colors where you see five main colors like blue and green and then you have five colors in between like this like blue green and green yellow um that you see like on this like ring around it which he um, defined as being the hue um and then like you see from the top to the bottom this like um grayish colors from black to gray to white um and then if you go from inside the cube to the outside there's a value called chroma which is something like the like color strength like how strong that color is. So like we'll talk about those like terms later, but like this is just something really uh, important to like define um, colors when we talk about color models. So um, if we go back a little bit more to the like artistic side, like I don't know how many of you heard about Bauhaus, who well, like it's a quite special year right now for like a hundred year anniversary. Um, so like, if you're longer in Berlin, there are cool museums uh, to check out and. Like Bauhaus is mainly about architecture design, but also about colors. And like, I will just focus on colors here. Um, so Johannes Itten was the Swiss um, arch uh, artist and like he was a teacher in this like Bauhaus school. Um, and he wrote a book called The Art of Color where he created this kind of color wheel here. So he was the first guy to talk about primary, secondary and tertiary colors that you see here being like the three main colors in the middle, those like triangular, um, shaped um, things like red, blue, and yellow. And if you mix two primary colors, you get a, t a secondary color. And then the like uh, tertiary colors um, mixed with like um, primary and secondary colors. So um, he defined those concepts that I guess like still many people use and you often like read and hear about in that um, in that field. Um, yeah, one of his um, students uh, was Joseph Albers, who's all in, like a German artist and he later was also teaching in the Bauhaus school, uh, school and he wrote a book that's called um, The Interaction of Color where he was just playing around with different colors and their effect if you put them next to each other um, and like the first like print of that book was quite limited and they had like 150 like colored silk plates in it to to play around on your own so that was quite quite something new and um, I guess that book is now available as an iPad app if you want to play around with that um, but mainly that book was talking about the uh, relativity of color, which like some color looks different. Like those two brownish um, rectangles here have the same color, they just look different. 
like not that much here, but like much more on my my computer, which is like perfectly on the field. Um, yeah, and like what he is most famous for is his like art series called the Homage to the Squares. Like I don't know how many museums you went to. Like maybe you've seen some of those, um, where he just puts in like nested squares together with like different colors, um, and you create some like really cool chromatic um, interaction with that. Um, and I guess like now this is kind of the question: like, is this art or is this science? So I guess like this is like always this really interesting like connection to it um and like those pieces were sold for like one to two million dollars so i guess that's quite good for an artist um like maybe not science in that way but it definitely has some scientific value so yeah to like really make it quick like just to talk quickly about some definitions that like you often see in that field so you get a better idea like uh, um, after today what people are talking about if they use some terms um, i just try to focus on the really important ones here so um, if you're like tint, tone, and shade, um, this is quite an easy concept in general. So like if you take a, a pure color like blue on the right and you mix pure white to it, it's called tint. If you mix pure black into it, it's a shade. And if you put in any shade of gray, it's, it, it's a tone. So it's just like three terms that I guess are just used quite often interchangeably, but like they just define something really, really different. Um, then we've seen U already, like the ring on the Mansell color uh, model that we have seen. So U is basically just a pure color. Um, and the special part of U is that it's like specified as an angle. So you have at like 0 and 360 degrees, you have red. At 120, you have green. And at 240, you have a blue. But you can specify any pure color here on this like dimension. And I guess like many people know like saturation, which is just some like... Um, like color intensity so on the left you can either mix white black or some kind of gray into it so on the left you will have like some shade of that and then like you go more into the pure color so like on the right you have like 100 uh, 100 percent of the pure color that we have seen um, on the u dimension um and then what's getting a little bit more tricky what you've seen before like the chroma um, it's kind of like similar to like saturation and all those concepts are kind of related to each other. Um, so that makes it a little bit difficult, in my opinion, to understand. So when, when we talk about chroma, we, we talk about the perceived strength of a color. So what you see here maybe is like on the left, we have like 100% white. On the right, we have 100% the color or black. And then in the middle, we have those shades of color or shades of gray, and they all have the same lightness. So, like this is the really important part here like you create some like lightness into into that dimension and um yeah just to finish it up um with something like a little bit more complex on the chart but like really easy to understand it's like there are two concepts called lightness and value which are really similar and like almost the same so i guess really important here is to understand like you have two charts here we have two colors like cyan and red next to each other which are like 180 degrees or like zero degrees in hue and then on the columns we see saturation from one to zero and then from zero to one again for the two colors and then what what i want to show you here is basically just like if you go the rows up and down which is like on the left we see lightness um, and on the right we see value so if you if you just want to try to like find the pure color you will see 50 percent of lightness is the pure color and 100 percent of lightness is just white light like makes sense on that uh, in that way um value on the other side just like skips that into half so like on 100 percent of value you get the full pure color so whatever you have like 50 percent value that's the same as 100 percent of lightness so like they all like are together and like different systems like different color models use like different um um yeah, of those concepts so um yeah if you talk about color models i guess you all know rgb and cmyk um so just to give you like a really like short um idea like um rgb um, and, and CMYK being like color models, like of a kind of different kind. Um, and the color model is always some kind of like abstract mathematical model. Um, and we have, um, additive color models that you see on the, on the left. So you start with like darkness, um, like black, and then you add light colors to it to create, um, like new colors. And this is basically what you see everywhere on like your phone, your TV, your computer screen. If you have like a black surface and you put colors on top of it. And on the right, like, um, a subtractive color model is just the opposite. You, you start with lightness, like a, like blank sheet of paper. And um, then you absorb light by putting colors on it and you mix those together to create new colors. And like, this is kind of a concept that's also used for like painting. Like you start with something like, like a plain surface. 
Um, yeah, and then like you always like this when, when you go to computers, you you probably notice like triples of um, of colors. Like for example, this RGB triplet, which you can visualize as this cube. So like it's kind of like a position in that cube. So like wherever you are in that cube, you can specify with that location. Um, and then all the color like models, you normally have like three or four different values. Um, maybe you have like seen those color models with the alpha channel to give you some opacity as well. Um, this is all like to, to sh like create the same color on different devices. So like this is like another um, like color model like HFL, which is basically um, U saturation and lightness. And um, that was developed in the 70s. I um, guess it's not really used anymore, but like it's just like more advanced now. Um, just to give you an idea, like how that looks, kind of in this like cylindrical um, shape of like U on the outside, um, saturation from inside to the out, and lightness from top to the bottom. And then like online, you will see all those like color pickers and like for the different programs that you use, it will like look a little bit different. Uh, but you can just like use different color models. Like here you see you have like RGB and HSLs, so, like you can recalculate it and like different color models are better for like different um, colors than others. But like it's always some kind of um, drawback on others. So just to um, yeah talk slightly about human perception of colors, like here, you should all see, like, if you just take the same color, um, we are quite sensitive to green light. So, like, even though we have, to, like, the same linear shade of color, we see here, like, we, we see green as more light than red and red more light than blue. Uh, this is just because of, like, the human, like, like cone cells do not work the same as we like translate them to like some color models so this is just something really important to to like realize in the human eye may not be perfect for like some kind of computer model that you see um on the other side um like as i said before they all like those concepts that we talked about are like kind of connected and related to each other so we also have this like saturation lightness dependency which is quite um, interesting to see so like if you see the u like which is just a ring of it and like on the left we have like a low lightness that goes up on the right and the saturation from the inside to the outside then we just see like something like a dark yellow is something we can't really see um, and on the other side like if you check the the like bluish um, and purple like we can see like just a lot of like middle and like high saturated um, colors and some others may not be um, that good and yeah, then coming back to Goethe, like warm and cool colors, which like he defined as the first first person, like warm colors being something we see as like daylight um, or like sunset maybe, um, and cold colors being like kind of connected to like some gray overcast day or something. And um, this is like highly depends on your cultural in, uh, influence. So like in different cultures, colors mean something different. So this is just something to be really aware of. And um, like the whole field of like color biology is just used a lot in like marketing and branding. So if you check like company logos, um, they normally have really good people there, like especially the, the big companies. Uh, if you see some small companies, you see some horrible logos and like horrible color choices, and they all want to like tell you something. Um, like it's some really cool stuff on the internet if you're like interested in like branding and marketing. Um, so like, yeah, those colors like mean something. So like you should be aware of that if you choose colors for your chart as well. So yeah, I guess like to just like wrap that all up into like some really easy points for you to like take take along on the road. Um, I created some really important parts here and then I have some do's and don'ts in the end. Um, and then I hope you all learn a lot to like make better charts. Um, in the short amount of time, like, you know, I can't tell you like those are the colors you should use. It really depends. Uh, but I hope you know after that, like what it is, like how you can get started easily. So um, like the first point being like, don't use color if you don't have to, like just try to make it gray. Um, I found this really cool article, which is called Make Gray Your Best Friend, which I really recommend all of you to read. It's really cool written, like they have some nice examples. Um, and it's, it's basically about like, you should use a, as much gray as possible and you should use color only to highlight what is important. Um, so like this is an example of that blog. Um, so like I would really recommend everybody reading that blog post to like get an idea and um, yeah, just use less colors in general. It's just a really big advice I can give everybody here. Um, second being um, like use different colors for different data. So like here you just see some like color harmonies or like something like pleasing, um, like aesthetically pleasing colors that go well together. 
um, but depending on your data and your problem, you should be aware of like you should maybe use different colors that are maybe like on the opposite of the wheel or maybe next to each other. So like depends if you have like categorical data, um, diverging data, sequential data. Like you should use colors that like go well with the data that you have at hand. This is also like just something really important. Like if you just use default colors, it will may lead to like some really false consequences in like what you think that means. <coughs> Um, next being like use um, intuitive colors if you can um, also like not always that easy like you just see like a world map with some like two like color maps here of like bluish and greenish colors being like green for the land and blue for the water if you would turn it around like I bet seeing that image will take like three seconds for you to understand it's like the globe or something um, it's just sometimes really difficult and um, yeah, like just try to make something that's sensible. Um, speaking of that, also like you always in dashboards have those like traffic signals. Like this is just horrible uh, in general. But like you know, like that goes into like being intuitive. Like it's not always that easy to to choose good colors for that. Um, yeah, like what I mentioned before, like think about like human perception of colors. Like they create some kind of feeling. Um, there's like a lot of like warm and cool colors like that may go well together or not. Um, and think about like some cultural influence. Um, like just different colors mean just something completely different. Like here, I guess like in, in Europe, um, we often see like red as love, exciting, maybe like some danger, but like in different countries, it could just mean something completely, completely different. So like think about your audience, like who will see that chart later. Um, yeah, then like another point, which I think most people never do, like included me, is like think about missing values. Like if you have some um, like null values, like non-data, and you just put it in there, like that you see on the left, um, you may come to the conclusion by just looking at it that you have some data values for water. Whereas if you would exclude that and like make it visible, like on the right, you will just see better, um, yeah, like, there's no data in it, like just to, to like something to think about. And like, I think the left one is prettier, but it's maybe more wrong. So like, I guess this is like the really interesting field here um, that you see. And then, uh, yeah, color blindness that I haven't mentioned so far. So like I was reading that like around 5% uh, of humans are at least partially colorblind. So like, I don't know how many can see that. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Like many people, like what I said before, like traffic lights, for example, you have like green and red or like those like normal pure colors. And this is just often a really bad choice because like if like one out of 20 is not able to see your chart anymore, like this is quite a lot. So like it depends, I guess, on the audience as well. Um, but it's quite easy to like choose colors which colorblind people can can um, can see as well. So like it's just not really a lot of effort for you, uh, but it will just make it easier for everybody else. So, like, another really practical tip for everybody here, like, I don't know who heard of the color brewer, um, which is, like, yeah, take one minute to create colors for your, uh, like, specific problem, and everybody's happy. Like, it's a really easy uh, website to use. So, like, you specify just, like, how many classes do you have, what kind of data do you have, like, do you have categories, do you have some, like, um, diverging or, like, qualitative data. Um, and then you can like see immediately how it looks like. You can choose, um, you can like choose some options to make like print friendly and um, colorblind safe. So it's like really it takes one minute and you can just export that into your Python notebook or like some other tools. Um, so like that makes it just really, really easy um, to choose colors. So like that's like what I would recommend everybody. Like everybody has one minute to spend on a chart. Like I would say like there are many other tools available. I just think this is the easiest to get started and the easiest to to like create quick colors for your um, visualization. So yeah, to finish that up, um, like just some more do's and don'ts and like a little bit more general. Um, and then I included tons of links here. So like if you want to like read more about all of that, like there are links here. Um, so I guess there's like a lot to, to do. Um, so like to do, first of all, like take your time. Like if, if you create charts, like just don't like take the first one, like don't use uh, those default colors, just take some time to, to create your charts um, and label the charts. Like really put in like labels on the axis, give it a title. Um, and I think it, nobody really puts text onto charts anymore, which I think is quite bad because even yourself, you see your own chart three weeks later and you have no idea what you did. So like just adding some text, like some description on it will just make it easier for everybody. Um, 
And then there's, there's this new concept, like I don't know how many of you here work with Tableau, um, about like storytelling and those like Tableau Zen masters, which are quite good at it. It's like just they think about their data with some questions and answers in their mind um, to create some like story, which just makes it easy for people to um, to understand. So like if you're interested in storytelling, um, just Google Tableau Zen masters and you will find like a lot of cool um, visualization um, stories that really answer questions that you didn't have before. Um, then also like what I didn't talk about here is like chart types. So like there's many different chart types. Um, there's really cool, um, tool from the financial times, um, that I included in the links, um, which is like a, a public Tableau dashboard about chart types. Like we didn't have time for that, but like think about what chart type, um, is good for you to use. And I guess it really depends on the problem. If you don't have those examples, but just some raw data, it may not be that trivial to like choose which chart type you want to want to um, use um, then like the more complex your charts get maybe it's a good idea to sketch first like if you spend like one or two days on like making the chart look like it should and then somebody tells you like yeah like that's not what i had in mind that's maybe easier to like sketch first to see what what may happen uh, for easy charts i guess it's not possible but if you grant those like fancy um sanky plots or something like that it makes sense to first sketch it to get a better idea if it even works um yeah, as I said before, like use as much gray as possible. Um, use color only to highlight what's really important, like what people should see and like see immediately and like what they should take along on the way. Um, then on general, like all those like um, charts that like have access always start at zero. It's super confusing if you don't, um, but it depends of course on the audience, but like just in general, it's just something really unintuitive to do. Um, you should, Think about handling your missing values to some extent. Like if you don't think about it, it will just do something that you may not be aware of. Um, so it's just a good idea to like think about it or like just exclude it from the data, but like think about it before you do it. Um, think about your audience as well. Like if it's a small audience, it may be a little bit more complex. It may be okay. Um, as a guideline, I would say check newspapers or like magazines like The Economist or The New York Times. Um, the charts that they are using are normally good for like a big audience. Um, and they also have really good people in doing that, um, with like colors, charts. So like, I guess like this is just like always a good inspiration to get from like getting some really good charts. And, um, yeah, like learn Matplotlib. Like I know it's horrible. The syntax is really confusing. Um, I try to do it, but like it's really, really difficult. Um, just a lot of Python libraries are based on Matplotlib. So at some point, if you want to do something really specific, you need to write Matplotlib code. And then it becomes just handy to know it. Um, but I know it's really awful. Um, and it's a lot, but in general, it's just like really helpful to know, uh, the more the better. Um, yeah. And I just like made a last minute change of like, yeah, talking about charts, uh, not including that one. I don't know of you, uh, who of you knows that chart, probably all of them. No, not even all. Okay. So many people say this is the best chart ever. Uh, from Minard, who was like um, vi visualizing the um, march from Napoleon to like Moscow. So you put in here like six or seven dimensions, I guess, into two. Um, and I guess there's like some stuff you can improve. Uh, like, first of all, like his handwriting is quite awful, I guess. But uh, just to give you an idea of like, you know, like there's a lot of text here to explain. So like what you see here is like the troops going from like, uh, like France to like Moscow. You see the size of the troop. You see how many like the black line, how many are wounded and like go back. Um, you see the dates, you see the location, you see the temperature and line on the bottom. Um, just to give you some idea, like how do charts look like if they're good? Um, and I just put that in here for the text because I think nobody puts text into charts anymore and they should do more. And yeah, just some like don'ts, uh, don't use 3D, uh, don't use pie charts normally, I would say, uh, and don't use the default colors. And, like this is probably the most horrible chart that I've ever seen so far. And like that was on TV. So, um, that's just really, really bad. Um, so I guess like you can all make something really much better than that, but there is a lot of like people around there making really horrible charts. So like it's quite difficult to find good examples when it's just so much looks the same or it's like not really that good. And like creating a perfect chart, you know, like even even that might not be perfect. Like there's always stuff to improve. And it's always just like personal preference. And um yeah, depends on you. So like I hope you like learned a lot. Um I put in like tons of links here, like where I got most of the information of the presentation, um, and also some more. So like if you're interested in that field, um yeah. Like, I hope you know a little bit more now um, and you're all excited about using less colors, but good ones from now on. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think maybe one question, a short one. All right, thank you for the talk. Uh, I just want to know if you have a fallback in the case of, um, let's say, different beamers. Sometimes um, you go to a conference or you go to any kind of presentation you have to do, and the, the beamer is not showing the good contrast. The colors don't look like well. So then again, is there some kind of plan B you do, or do you already research how those uh, rooms and beamers look like? And even the size of the beamer sometimes matters, so uh, like choosing correct sizes. I know that's uh, two questions now, but... yeah. Plan B is the question. For that presentation, I didn't, but I also didn't have time for that. Um, but in general, I guess it's a good way. But I don't don't think many people have time to like you know like create different charts for like different colors. But in in general, it will be really good to be prepared for those changes. So I guess it depends on the audience. Like if you have a big audience of people, um, it may be really good to have different charts. Like if you have like you know like your like a company presentation, that may be really good to have like different contrast colors. Um, but there are like some tools available for contrast, um, like to choose colors with like a high contrast, for example, if you want to show that. So even if the beamer has not the best contrast, it will probably still look okay on a on a big beamer. Okay, so if you have more questions, I think then you will be around the conference the next uh, three days. So thank you very much, and thank him again, please.